This lecture is about streams, lazy evaluation, and infinite sequences in Scala. A good working definition of a stream is, it is a list whose tail is evaluated only on demand. So the way that we create a stream is quite similar to the way that we create a list. For example, here, we create a stream using the current constructor by providing the first element in the stream and the remaining elements in the stream. And the remaining element of the stream is also constructed with the conj constructor with the first element and the remaining stream. And this is the way that you create the stream by directly providing the element. Because of the similarity in their definition, and also the way that they are constructed, list programming and stream programming look quite similar. So here's an example. This function list range returns a list of integers in a given range specified by the lower limit and the upper limit. And this is another function, which is essentially the same as this one but returns a stream of integers instead of list of integers. So if we compare these two functions, we notice that their structure is essentially the same. For example, here we return an empty list, here we return an empty stream, and here we concatenate the first element with the remaining elements, and here we concatenate the first element and the remaining elements. This list function looks a bit simpler because not here we take advantage of the infix operator, whereas here we have to apply this method directly. Other than that, these two functions are uh, essentially the same, except that this works on lists, and this works on streams. And the question is, why is it that this stream range, this method, this function, which works on streams, is so simple? To better understand the internal implementation of streams in Scala, let's go back to list and stream programming in OCaml. So this is the definition of a list in OCaml. So we have the empty list and another constructor, which takes the first element and the remaining list. And this is the way that we implement stream in OCaml. Similarly to the definition of a list, we have an empty stream and we have another constructor, which takes the first element, but the remaining element is not provided directly Instead, we build a function taking the unit argument and returning another stream that contains the remaining element. So in this way, we simulate a lazy evaluation using functions of this form, whose argument has this unit type. And here are two examples of creating infinite streams in OCaml. These ones create an infinite stream of integer ones. So the first element is one, but the remaining element is the same one. So you'd like to use the same definition ones, which is currently under construction. But because of the type in this definition, you have to provide this function which delays the computation of ones. So in this way, we can create an infinite stream of ones in OCaml. In this example, we create an infinite stream of natural numbers starting from n. So it has type int stream, and it has the first element n. And to provide the remaining elements, we create another into the stream, but we have to delay the computation. So we wrap 
this stream of integers inside this function. Then the argument, the second argument, matched the type shown over here. Finally, we call the function from with the starting element, which is 0. In this way, we create an infinite stream of natural numbers. So the point in this slide is, in OCaml, in order to implement streams, you have to manually define new data type where the key idea is you delay computation by wrapping the value inside the function. In other words, you simulate lazy evaluation using functions. Here's the comparison of the Kanji operator in OCaml and Scala. This is the definition of a stream in OCaml. And we see that the Kanji operator takes a function of this type for the remaining element. So as a result, in order to obtain the remaining element, you have to actually extract this function, say, f from the Kanji operator and then apply this function to a Dermy argument of a type unit. Only then you can obtain the remaining element. In contrast, in the case of a Scala programming, it suffices to specify that the remaining element uses this lazy evaluation with this double arrow symbol. That's all is required. Now, in order to extract the remaining element, you can just reference the remaining element at this tail. And everything is automatically taken care of by the Scala compiler because the Scala compiler recognizes this double arrow symbol and applies a lazy evaluation whenever you needed to compute this remaining element. To summarize, the syntax for lazy evaluation is much simpler in Scala because we eliminated the need for this dummy function call, like this one in Scala programming, because we have this built-in support for lazy evaluation. That's the reason behind why the implementation of streams in Scala is much simpler. Scala supports lazy initialization with the keyword lazy. If we declare a variable x with a lazy val, we tell the Scala compiler to assume call by need semantics for this variable x, which means that it evaluates this initialization expression at most once. So the first time this variable x is dereferenced, Scala evaluates this expression and then caches the result somewhere in memory. The next time this variable x is dereferenced, it directly reuses the previous result cached in memory. In this way, Scala never evaluates this initialization expression more than once. If this variable x is never dereferenced at all, then this expression is never evaluated either. With the lazy initialization in Scala, we can achieve a more efficient implementation of counter constructor for streams, which can be useful in some cases, although not always. In the previous implementation of cons, we use def which means that every time we access this method tail, we go back to the second argument of the Kanji constructor and then evaluate it. So we evaluate the second argument on demand, but we evaluate it every time we call this method tail. But with the lazy val, in addition to on-demand computation of the second argument, we evaluate it only once, at most once, the first time this tail method is called, because the result of evaluating the second argument is cached in memory, thanks to the use of this lazy val. So this can be quite useful if you access 
the remaining elements in the given stream many times. It turns out that lazy initialization is much more powerful than it appears superficially because it is thread safe, which means that variables with lazy initialization are safe to access even in the presence of many concurrent threads attempting to access these variables. So here's a simple quiz. How many lines of a Java code would you need in order to replace this code in Scala, which initializes this variable component with lazy fail? The answer is you need more than 10 lines. This is the equivalent Java code that implements lazy initialization. The code looks complicated because it employs a design pattern called double checked locking. So the idea is the following. First, we declare the variable with this volatile keyword so that every thread accessing this variable component obtains the up-to-date value. In order to access the variable, we first get the current value. So now, result contains the current value. And if the current value is not null, then we just return the value because it means that another thread has previously computed this component variable. Otherwise, we might be the first to access this variable component. So we decided to try to evaluate this variable component. Because this variable can be accessed by multiple concurrent threads simultaneously, we obtain a lock so that no other threads can update while we are trying to update this variable. But the problem is, during the shorter period of time between this line where we access the variable to obtain the current value and this line where we obtain a lock, another thread might have evaluated this variable and update its value. So even inside this lock, we have to check the value again. So if the value is if the update value is null, it means that no other thread has attempted to access the variable. So we are indeed the first thread that accesses this variable. Otherwise, we just return the result because another thread has evaluated this variable during this short period of time. So this pattern is called double check locking because we check the value twice here and inside this lock. But this is an example of implementing infinite streams in Scala. This function from takes an integer n and returns an infinite stream of integers starting from n. So the first element is n and the remaining element is another stream starting from n plus 1. So in order to implement stream of all natural numbers, we call the function from with the starting element 0. A nice thing about streams in Scala is you can use all the popular high order combinators such as map. So by applying this map method with this function, you can easily create stream of all multiples of a 4. Here's an example of using infinite streams of integers to implement the sieve of Eratosthenes. This function sieves takes a stream of integers and returns another stream of integers. We take the first element of the argument S, the head element, and in order to compute the remaining elements, we take the remaining elements from the argument and then apply this filter method which eliminates all those elements that are divided by the first header element. 
Finally, we make a recursive call again to compute the sieve of Aristotelianism from the remaining elements. Then, in order to compute the infinite stream of prime numbers, we call this, this function sieve with argument, which is basically an infinite stream of integers starting from 2. It may appear like this code is quite inefficient because of the use of streams and higher order functions. But it turns out that this implementation is quite efficient because no computation is wasted.